Hi everyone and welcome to a very different podcast. So today's podcast is actually uh, taken from Find the Gap podcast by uh, Sam Dunn. Sam Dunn is a strength and conditioning coach and sports scientist, very smart man, and has this great idea of interviewing support staff in elite sport and asking them about the various things that they do to maintain peak performance, look after themselves and and their own welfare. So today is an interview with me by Sam. He asks some great questions. Uh, I give some answers answers that I think are probably interesting. Uh, So if you're interested, give it a listen. And if you want to uh, hear more of his podcasts, uh, we'll have links in the show notes at the end of this. Um, But yeah, find the Gap podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Durham, mate, thanks for jumping on. Thanks for having me. No worries, mate. First of all, how are you? I'm good. Well, yeah. uh, I'm goodish. <laughs> yeah, obviously, uh, at the, at the at straight away into the lockdown number five for Melbourne. Yeah, uh, look, I, I take each lockdown as as a challenge. Uh, so it's like, d- don't fall to pieces. What can you what can you gain out of it? Um, so I'm a bit irritated that we're in it again, and it, once again, it's kind of out of our control, not not our fault. Um, but I'm trying to just kind of push past that um, and just uh, have a pretty cruisy weekend, have two days off in a row, which I don't do very often, and then um, attack it hard next week and we'll try and we'll try and make some more stuff. So the last few lockdowns, we completely reconfigured the big one, completely tore up our gym and started over. The very last one, most recently, we completely changed our back end delivery in terms of all our uh, athlete notes um and this one will uh, will do some other things in the background so that i like to come back out of it and things to be feeling like we've gained something out of it yeah. um i kind of think of, of it like a ship in dry dock if you can change stuff that's a that's a good chance 100 that's a really positive way to look at it to be honest because a lot of people don't think that way so you, you're a step ahead mm-hmm. there um but mate Fun. just give me a little bit of a quick rundown of um of, of yourself where you're at the moment maybe a little quick little rundown of how you got to where you are uh maybe educational background mm-hmm. and We'll go from there. So I am the director uh, and founder of Core Advantage. We're a private athletic development company. So we train athletes across uh, about 30 sports from um, domestic to Olympic level. I am the speed and agility coach for the Melbourne Boomers in the Women's National Basketball League. Uh, I've worked in the WNBL since 2003 and um, with the Boomers since 2009. We work with Basel Victoria and a whole bunch of other sporting organisations as well, delivering services for them. Um, and I serve on the advisory board to Deakin University's undergrad sports science course. Uh, so I've, I've got a few different hats. I'm lucky enough to have an amazing team that works with me. So my coaches are really, really good. So a lot of people often falsely ascribe our success to me. Uh, I always think it's, it's important to be pretty clear uh, that I'm the one people think of, but it's an amazing team of, of top operators. Uh, that's My mild superpower is not that I'm the best coach in the world it's that i reckon i'm really good at putting together a great team and developing that team so i sort of fell into this space it wasn't it wasn't part of my game plan my original plan coming out of high school i wanted to be a political consultant so i thought i wanted to work into sort of the um the politics space and then i decided i i got into honors in politics in my undergrad which is um, a double major in politics and sociology got into honors and decided actually I didn't want to do that um, and quit. I'm a big fan of quitting stuff when you don't you don't want to do it. And then I sort of uh, went and studied marketing and actually decided I didn't want to do that and I quit that. And then I drifted around for a while and fell into personal. I, I, I kind of created a gap year for myself teaching English in Japan, and I uh, had a, I had I had a gap year before my gap year. So I had six months. I got a gig in Tokyo. But I had six months before the gig started, so I did my my PT certification back back in the day, a long long time ago, and then I kind of fell into personal training, and that went extraordinarily well. So much so that I had to, I thought I couldn't leave it, so I didn't go to Japan. And then I I did an apprenticeship under this guy Bruce Gray, kind of the godfather of Australian basketball strength and conditioning at Gym called Body World, and I loved it. And I thought, oh, wow, I want to be an SNC coach. This is incredible. Um, and it was a lot less formal back then. It was very different in 99 and, um, and even the early 2000s. And then um, I was really lucky. A, a friend of mine, one of the other trainers in the gym, he got a gig. He's the head coach of the Dandenong Rangers. 
had been hired to work for the North Melbourne Giants in the NBL. And JD, my friend, was working um, with the Rangers in the WNBL. And he couldn't keep both gigs. Like they were mutually exclusive. You had to commit to a team. Mm. And he said, um, hey, I've, I've got this new gig. I know you like basketball. I know you did that sort of apprenticeship with Bruce. Do you want the gig? I was like, what do you mean do I want the gig? And he's like, I'll, I'll, put in, I'll put in the word and I'll get you the gig. And so I had a meeting with the captain because that's how things were back then. Um, and she hired me. I called up the CEO and I said, hi, I'm in your s and He's like, oh, yeah, what do we pay you? And I told him what JD got paid. He's like, okay, cool, we'll pay you that. And, yeah, that kind of was just a piece of really good luck. And then I worked my guts out. Like I treated that job, which was not paying very much. I treated that job like it was paying me $100,000. Like I did every single thing I could do. Um, not strategically. It was just I've got a bit of OCD. I, I'm not good. I'm not good at half-assing stuff. Mm. Um, so I just went all in. And right place, right time. Plus we had a really good group. Plus my stuff worked. My approach worked pretty well. Um, so we basically went back-to-back national championships. No acquired injuries over two years. 44 wins, six losses. And everyone you know, gave me more credit than I reckon I was due for how all that went. Um, but that kind of created a snowball. The president started sending, president of the club started sending me athletes um, and it just went kaboom after that. And then I was training way more junior athletes than I could, uh, I could cope with. Have you read uh, Relentless? The, I think it's the strength. Of- I've got it on my bookshelf, but I haven't read it. Well, I won't spoil for you, but he goes into categories of cleaner, closer, and a, I've forgotten the last one, but you'll get it anyway. And from, from what you said about working like the job that was paid hardly anything, but you work like it was paying hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, it, that's towards like this category called the cleaner. And the cleaner is someone like, for example, Michael Jordan, who's attention to detail, yeah, right. no, no matter what. Yeah. You know? That doesn't worry about the finer details, the attention, or the kind of like media. It just wants the final result, kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Sounds like you're going down that path. So yeah. By the way, you should give, definitely give that a give that. I a need read. to read that book. That sounds exactly like me. Yeah, I I have I've got issues. Like I, I have trouble. Well, that's the thing. Uh, he links not- well. Like the clean is not the person that is horrible, like liked all the time. It's not the person who's totally respectful, but that is the person that gets the results and the dedicated person out yeah. of the other categories. Um, yeah, I, have, I, I love getting the details right. I, I love um, my business partner, Jacob Tober. He's got this great saying, how you do anything is how you do everything. And I try and uh, we, we try and live by that as much as we can. And that's good that you've got such a strong team as well to, 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 uh, to build from. And that, that will lead me into the first thing I want to bring up, mate, is being a business owner, uh, especially during this time. Mm. What, 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 is it, what is it like for you as a business owner but being in lockdown every few months and, and, and trying to grow? Yeah, look, it's really, um, it's an, it's, it has its gifts, it has its opportunities, but it has its struggles. The struggles are pretty obvious, uh, and that is that it just messes with your momentum. So just as you're starting to get back going in sports, starting to get going, because I mean, the thing is, people don't, if people aren't playing sport, they don't particularly feel a strong need for strength and conditioning. So we, 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 we live off people's need to be ready for sport. And so we do see a much lower um, demand uh, when it comes to that. So the negative is definitely that it's hard to get momentum. People don't have confidence. And then, you know, the economics of the situation are that people are less confident about spending money. Like a lot of people are stowing their money away a little bit because they just don't know what's coming. And I suppose the third thing is it, it's challenging for your team chemistry when you're not around each other as much. Because mm-hmm. no matter how hard we work as a coaching staff um, to stay as a tight-knit group, it's just different when you're not in the building with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, yeah, so momentum and finances and just team teaminess, I suppose, is the, the big challenges. Um, but on the flip side, there are big opportunities in in every lockdown, I reckon. Because one of the biggest things, when, you, when you've got a business, there's always these things you want to be doing, but you don't have time because there's too many bloody customers in the way. <laughs> like there's all these things that you've got to you got to attend to, but it's just constant, it's constant input of, oh, you need to do this, this, all these, I to call it, being in the thick of thin things. Like you've got all these little things you've got to get done um, that get in the way. Whereas lockdown gives you a chance to step back and, and look at what you're doing. Yeah, that's that's the opportunity there. And we, like the first one, we completely tore up our entire business model. We tore up our whole gym. We changed, we went from being a 
a kid oriented, you know, a younger athlete oriented class based gym mm. uh, to being a more uh, grown up oriented athlete driven open gym model. So we're now way more similar to the guys at Melbourne Strength Culture in terms of how we run our, our system. Uh, I took a lot of inspiration from, from Jamie um, and how he does, does his thing. Um, and that's obviously also taken from Cressy. Like there's that sort of idea of create a more adult environment, empower your athletes to do more. And we never would have, we never could have made that transition without, without the punctuation mark that is COVID. Yeah. Like we couldn't have just gone, okay, uh, Friday on Friday night, we're a class-based system, really friendly to young kids. On Monday with this, it just wouldn't have worked. Um, so we've now got this amazing cultural shift that we've had over the last 12 months, which is 100% attributable to lockdown. But like we, we always wanted to make that leap, but we never could have without that. So that's been the positive um, that, that. And then now each time it happens, it's like, all right, well, the ship's up in dry dock. We've got no customers. We have to worry. But we're still like looking after online programming stuff, but it's not the same as running the gym for eight hours a day. Uh, what can we do this time to make stuff better? What resources can we make? Uh, what what videos can we film? What can we do that makes use of the time? Um, so I don't love it. I'm not voting for any more of them. Um, but every time it happens, it's just like, well, where where does the opportunity where's the opportunity hiding? So yourself and Jacob being the the owners of the gym, and you've got a few people under you. Uh, how how do you address? I should, I should mention we've got a bit of a we've got a few other owners too. So like um, my brother's also involved in the business, and he is at least as much uh, the so he's the general manager. So yep. he's at least as much the brains of the business. Um, if it wasn't if it wasn't for him and Jacob, there would be no core advantage. Yeah. Um, so, and then with all of you guys at the top. Um, delegating tasks below you um, and even amongst yourselves, how, mm. how important or how do you really communicate the issue of, you know, staying, uh, staying mentally well throughout this pandemic and throughout these lockdowns through your employees? It's look, there's no systems other than um, in the big lockdown, we invested in giving them all a budget to go away and buy whatever continuing education courses they wanted to do. Yeah so that they could have some extra learning and of interest. Um, and then it's just, it's just checking in with everyone. It's just making sure that, that everyone's good and they've got what they need. Um, and look, we are a very flat structure. So I, I know that the worst thing we could have is because I'm so much older than, I'm, I'm, I'm 48, I've been doing this 21 plus years. There's such an age and experience gap. It'd be really easy for me to have a situation where everyone just agreed with me. Yep. Um, so I work really hard at flattening that structure out. Everyone's very encouraged to disagree. And we're very much about as flat a hierarchy as you can get. Mm -hmm. um, so people can tell me when I'm wrong. And um, so when it comes to that, it's more just keeping our team dynamics going along and not just doing team Zooms, like actually picking up the phone and calling everyone and seeing how, how they're doing. And um, yeah, and uh, but I think the biggest thing is, um, there's, I think it's a Viktor Frankl quote about um, you can endure any discomfort if you've got a strong enough why. I can't remember the exact quote. Um, here at Man's Search for Meaning, and, it, uh, uh, and it's just this idea that if your if your why is good, you'll you'll grind through successfully. And so our why is that everyone in the business is pretty competitive. Like we want to be the best, yeah. um, and so that will tend to see us through as long as we keep the vision alive. Of right, we. We want to do this the best way we can and come out of this in the best possible position so that we can competitively continue to to push really hard yeah. um our aim is to be the best in the world at what we do like and we know that you know we might fall short of that um but i like that I, as a as a standard like all right let's try and be so what, what would you say if you end up being the third best in the world like that's okay you <laughs> know Second best in Australia. That's also pretty good. You know, like, uh, so we prefer to aim high. Yeah, I'd, I'd take a bronze medal in a world competition like that. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so either just for yourself, then not not in terms of your business and during COVID, but what what do you say you're struggling with the most at the moment? I'm most struggling with. So, I've attend. I'm pretty good at attending to my general 
physiological, psychological health. I train every single morning without fail. So I run and I, I just alternate running and lifting. So I run, lift, run, lift, run, lift. Um, I, I'm pretty good at, at eating well. Um, try not to eat my feelings too much um, with mixed success. Um, I'm struggling the most just with how, and I don't want to get political because it's, you know, I don't know about that, but how preventable this shit storm is. <laughs> it's like, like we had, it's, you know, it's, I feel like with this really important rich kid, it's just fucking it up. Yeah. Like we saw Italy, we saw Italy happen 20 months ago. How did Israel's prime minister call the head of Pfizer 30 times and ours hasn't called him once? Um, I'm pretty fine apart from that. It's just more we shouldn't have to be in this. It's like I feel like we're doing our job really well. Uh, and so I struggle to be, and I'm usually pretty zen like, like usually something shitty will happen. And I'm pretty good at going, well, that's happened. Getting angry about it but isn't going to help. I will just, I'll just roll with whatever's happening and I'll make the best of it. Um, but every now and then it kind of bubbles up. I'm like, oh, just get your act together, people. I love I love science. Like science is amazing, and if you've watched the pro, the process of producing the the Pfizer vaccine, it's amazing. It's there's an I'll I'll find the video. I'll send it so you can put it in your show notes. It's like a twenty step process of how they do it, and every step is so incredible. And it's like it's good. Like it's just it's just a miracle they managed to do it. Like it's incredible. And I had I had the um, vaccination a couple of weeks ago. It was great. Um, it's just, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so that adds to my anger. Cause I'm like, ah, oh, this like the workers are doing the job. The scientists are knocking it out of the park. We just need our bureaucrats to just follow a pretty basic plan. But yeah, um, but I, I, I'm pretty, I still think we're pretty like in our particular individual circumstances, we're pretty lucky. Um, we had during the first lockdown, uh, we put to our people, look, stick with us, we'll reduce your prices. But if you keep training with us, we'll train you online. And we had an amazing percentage of people vote with their feet and do that and stick with us. And yep. so those people kept us alive. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and we had some good government support. Like the reality is that they did get that part of it right. Yep. Um, and so we're in a good position where um, we can, we, we, it's not where, this, where the incompetence is not gonna kill us. Mm -hmm. It makes it, it's a bit of a headwind but it's not going to kill us. So that's, uh, that's good. But I should say, like I'm painting, to be, I'm painting a bit of a glib picture. In, in the first lockdown, when I didn't know we were going to make it, it was very different because now it happens. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we got this. We know how to do this. But the first one, um, I fell into the second deepest depression of my life. Mm. Like it was really tough. Um, uh, the deepest was after I got sacked by the Danong Rangers. So we went... Um, uh, championship, championship, runners up fourth, and then we all got the sack. And I'd put in my heart and soul. I was doing that hundred thousand dollars worth of time, and I went from that to just being gone. Um, and I didn't realize at the time, but when you're in a pro sports team, there is a beautiful bubble you're in where um, you're just around these people. It's it's a different level of bond that you have in the rest of your life. It's a really nice nice bubble. Um, and having that kind of wrenched away uh, really messed me up pretty bad. And I was probably in a depression for about six months after that one, and I didn't notice that at the time. And I vowed to myself that I would be really attuned and next time I'd notice. Um, but that was 2006, so it was a bit of a long time between drinks. I didn't start drinking, by the way, I should say. <laughs> like <it's> an... <laughs> um, I fell into a really deep depression uh early on in the first one and I let a few people down. I, I didn't get stuff done as I would have liked. And, um, and I just didn't know what was happening. I didn't notice why I just didn't, I just wanted to kind of hide under the doona. Um, mm. So that really knocked me around that first time. And I think that probably has fueled my unwillingness to let it knock me around again. Mm. It's kind of like, you know, fool me twice, um, you know, fool me once, uh, shame on you, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on me, whatever it is, you know, quote. George Bush does a really funny mangling of it. Um, yeah, he does. Does a great does. I think that comes up in a J. Cole <laughs> song as well. But that's. Would you say when you when you were when you were fired from the Rangers? And yeah, you had, they had that long period of depression. Uh, did you feel mm. quite 
in terms of like not knowing what was next, would you feel quite vulnerable? And yeah, your- I didn't. I didn't know what I was doing. All I knew is that I didn't want to do that work um, with in that space. Well, I no, that's not true. What I knew, uh, what it did was, I felt very depressed and very sad, but also very determined that I would never let that happen to me again. And so very determined that I would actually do an even better job than I had previously. Mm-hmm. So um, the one thing I don't reckon I was as good at in the first, in that first act of my career was making sure that what I was doing um, was defensible. Because when you, when you pick apart uh, a strength and conditioning program, it's very easy to be negative and go, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Even though our, res- our results spoke for themselves. Um, the second time around, I was much more, I was much better at sort of making sure I was structuring everything in a way that I could explain exactly why we were doing and, and what we we're doing. But I also like, I got really lucky too in that I got the sack from that gig as did our head coach. And then relatively shortly after, so I had that depression period. And then it wasn't that long after um, that we had, so I got the gig as the Australian Sapphires, which is our under 21 national team. Uh, as their SNC coach, and so we were, we were going for the World Championships in 2007. I got that gig because our head coach basically just said, I, I, "I'll um, I'm only going to take the gig if I can name my team, my staff," and so yeah, that just got me straight. And so I straightened over the top of a couple of people from the AIS, which um, ruffled a few feathers. But I had that to focus on again as well. Like that's kind of what dragged me out. Like I was feeling pretty crappy, but then I was like, "All right, you've actually got a, a World Championships to prepare mm. uh, for." So that was. That, that was a bit of a saving grace. Yeah, that's that's very common in a lot of, especially football as well, um, you know, following the coach because they've built that relationship. It shows how rare it is, you know, to have that and mm. to, to just, you know, even cross continents with the coach because you've had, a, because A, they want you there, but B, you have that connection there. You know, you will succeed with that person. You don't want to not as so much trust someone else, but you, you're not willing to take the risk as of yet when you already have that built with someone else. I- the trust thing is absolutely huge. Yeah, so Gary went across to the Boomers and he was an assistant coach there and he said to the head coach, we've got to get, we've got to get Durham across. Mm. Uh, and so I got off that job over the phone. I haven't, I haven't even met the head coach. I was like, we should meet. You mightn't even like me. <laughs> like, um, yeah, uh, that trust piece is, is just humongous. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And you said that you, you don't want to go through that experience ever again. Um, but mm. now working in the, the more like the private gym sector, giving mm. the chance to go back into that industry or that back in the strength conditioning, you know, team environment, would you take it? What I really like is like, I like the little micro role. Like I've got a little micro role with the boomers now where I'm the speed and agility coach. Yeah. Um, so I'm getting to work with the team, but it's not my everything. Um, I, I don't, I think the, um, you know, like the allure of working full-time in the AFL, like that's kind of the, that's kind of the gold standard for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, but you talk to a lot of people, you know, I've talked to, to Lockie Wilmot about it. You talk to a lot of people who have actually been at the, very successful at the top level in that space. It's like, it's great, but you are on call 80 hours a week. Yeah. Um, and it, you do ride on the success of the team you're working with. Um, and yeah, so I, I probably wouldn't rush back to, and I've got a young family as well. It's something that I'd consider, but I actually kind of like these little smaller roles and then, um, having the fun of working with our team. I, I think um, the benefits of being able to name your hours a little bit more and not losing your weekends. I, I spent a hell of a lot of my summers not being away, away to get, able to go away camping because I was high performance manager with the boomers back then and I just couldn't do stuff like that. And um, I do like having your summers off. Mm-hmm. So then, and then the importance of not, not, denying opportunities but just as a strength coach saying the word no to things how important is that yeah it's it's really hard because i think you just you know if you've seen saying yes to things lead into all these unexpected serendipitous benefits then it's really hard to say to say no to stuff um and i i'm trying to get better at saying no I was really intrigued when Mike Boyle, um, who's one of my favorite SNC coaches in the world, when he quit from the Boston Red Sox, like they'd, they'd won a world championship, which is what they call it, or you know, World Series, whatever they call it in the baseball. He'd done really well, and he had his business, and he had his family, and he had the Red Sox, 
and he quit the Red Sox. And he talked about that in depth on one of his podcasts. And I was like, that's so yeah, that was the only thing I could I could quit that was, you know, gonna increase my, my quality of life. So yeah, I, I so recently I um, pulled out of the process of um, the boomers were hiring a high performance manager, which is you know a job that was pretty much made for my skill set and experience. Um, working for the coach Guy Malloy, who I'm very very close with, um, but I I got into the interview of it and I was like, oh, I'm gonna let the, I'm gonna let the person I care most about in this process, the head coach, down if I go through it because I can't quite commit to what it needs, right. and I'm just gonna burn myself out. Um, so it was. It was the hardest decision I've ever made. Like it, um, it was so interesting. I, I made the decision, called him up, let him know, and um, I was like, "Cool." Like it really, it was. A, I agonized over it. Made the decision for the for the business, for my family, and for the club. It actually wasn't the right play. The right play was for me to um, keep a smaller role, um, and got it all sorted. I was like, "Cool. Well, at least I can have a good night's sleep tonight. Like I'll, I'll be okay." And then proceeded to literally have the worst night's sleep in my life. Because <laughs> um, uh, I track my sleep with, with auto sleep off, off my Apple Watch. And usually what, it, usually what it shows is, I'm not a great sleeper, but usually what you see is purple in my thing is den- denotes deep sleep. Right. And you have a certain amount of hours of deep sleep and you, my resting heart rate will go down, you know, it'll get down to about 48 is, is a, good, a good number. Um, and uh basic and if things go badly everything's in red mm. uh so i woke up the next morning and i'd been in bed for seven and a half hours which is enough um but i'd had like six minutes of deep sleep yeah. um and like, so it was like the front of my brain the thinky part of my brain was totally in agreement this is what we should do um but the 90 percent of my brain that doesn't speak english that just has feelings and fears <laughs> It didn't want to have a bar of it. It was oh, yeah. it was fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Where where do you find support and your confidence when you have these kind of like not depressive episodes, but when you have these feelings, you know, all these uncertain feelings? Like, is it through family, through work? It's a bit of it's a bit of both. Um, it's through family. Um, my wife is a very smart, very strategic woman who's. Uh, um, you know, a great person to bounce ideas off. And um, she's very comfortable telling me when I'm being stupid as well. So that's always good. Uh, my kids are amazing because, you know, they're still at an age where uh, I, I'm still the, the best dad in the universe because they're only nine and 12. So I've got, I've got a couple more years of that. <laughs> um, and, then, and then, look, um, my team is astonishingly good at, at that. So, like, what, there was a point where I was a bit down. A couple of them got together and wrote this beautiful little note uh telling me what all my strengths were because i can be a pretty harsh judge of myself okay um and yeah like i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to frame that it was a it was a, a really um sweet gesture and uh like a powerful thing so uh, yeah i'm pretty lucky and then just friends in the industry um because we are a nice little i think one of the other positives of COVID is everyone stops stabbing each other in the back like we're all a lot nicer, I think, because, you know, it can be a pretty catty industry, the s space. I remember um, Brett Bartholomew talking about how he was talking to some lawyers and they were, the lawyers like, geez, you strength conditioning guys are brutal to each other. Like lawyers are nicer to each other than s coaches are. <laughs> I reckon that's probably, that's probably pretty accurate. Um, and just touching on it as well, because obviously you're tracking your sleep. You, uh, I'm assuming that you, you consider that quite important for your own health and well-being. Do you want to just touch on that for just a little bit on what how you think yeah, sleep, sure. sleep is like a big factor for your own kind of feelings or well-being or just... Sleep's just such a big deal. You know, I used to think sleep was one of the pillars hmm. um, and I realised that's completely wrong because it's not one of the pillars. It's the platform that the pillars rest on. 100%. Um, it's actually more important than, than the pillars. For me, you know, so, uh, you know, we consolidate our memories. Um, I, I read... Um, Dr. Matthew Walker's book, uh, Why We Sleep, and that was a mind-blown thing. Like, I'd always kind of had the idea that sleep was just like when my computer's asleep, it's just kind of switched off. I didn't really understand all the processes that were going on, like how, how active sleep is, how we're cleaning out all the junk and waste products in our brain, and just so much going on. Um, but for me, if I'm, if I'm sleeping well, I'll train hard, 
and I'll produce really good work at work and then I'll feel happy and then I'll sleep well. So it's a, it's a positive cycle. Uh, whereas the reverse is uh, if I don't sleep well, I know that my, uh, my ghrelin, my hunger hormone will go through the roof. I know that my leptin hormone will go through the floor. And so I want to eat everything in sight. Um, th that happens. I know that my fuse gets shorter. Um, so I've got a pretty good ability to generally have a delay between stimulus and response. Uh, like someone can do something irritating and I can, you know, process and come back. But when I'm, when I'm underslept, I don't do that so well. Um, and I just feel a bit crap. So, uh, and I, and look, um, one of the interesting things that happens as you get a little older, which I had no idea about when I was younger, is a younger brain is better at blocking out distractions and better at remembering stuff. And when I'm underslept, it really amplifies the fact that I'm not as good at that as I was when I was younger. It's like I've got more wisdom than I had when I was 38, mm -hmm. but I've definitely got to work harder to maintain that uh, attention. I mean, yeah, so sleep's super, super important. And I like to track it because... What I find is that I don't, um, I don't always have a great sense when I first get up of whether it was a good night's sleep or not. My energy is often the same, and it's only you get about halfway through the day and you go, oh, God, I feel crap today. Mm -hmm. Whereas I like being able to just kind of, like you check the weather, I just kind of check, oh, yeah, that was a pretty good night's sleep. Or if it comes up bad, I'm like, all right, I need to be on red alert because I may well be getting pretty snappy with people today. It just gives me a good status report on myself. I like that. I like that analogy about the weather because you, you do check the weather. You're going to prepare your day based on what the weather's like. You know, what am I going to dress up like? What am I going to, yeah. am I going to go out for lunch? Am I going to go for a walk? You know, if you wake up with bad sleep, how am I going to get my, my day ahead of me to then sleep better that night? You know, how am I going to change the way I act, do things? Um, I'm going to just give you three quick fire questions, mate. And I want you to answer them truthfully, uh, a little short description after them. And then um, we'll, 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 we'll finish up after that one. Uh, but what I'm, the first question I'm going to shoot at you is uh, just a, give me a skill or ability that you've overestimated or oversold to people in the past. Oh, that's too good. Uh, no, I've got it. Uh, early days, the skill of sports specificity. Okay. Uh, where, where I was like, like in my first year, I did some, did some dumb stuff because I thought, I thought sports specific was good. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, and, and that was just rookie mistakes. And thank God there isn't. Like if there was if there was uh, social media back then, there'd be there'd be images of me saying, "Look at this great exercise we're doing." It's sports specific, but thankfully there isn't, because <laughs> you know, like it's it's complete rubbish. Like you should be specific to the athlete, specific to the injury trends. But yeah, athlete specificity is so much more important than um, than sports. So yeah, that, that's yeah. I massively oversold that at the start. Uh, next one is what's an embarrassing event that has had a permanent effect on you? <laughs> okay. Oh, there's so many. Um, <laughs> this isn't permanent, but it is. But it is. Uh, it's worth sharing. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget. Young, young. My my son was maybe uh, eighteen months old, so he's still still pretty young. And I got a bit dad bod, like I got a bit skinny fat. And I was in the gym, and I was training. <laughs> I was training training a couple of of uh, you know like. Uh, elite athletes, uh, one of whom went on to represent Australia, and, and they're both uh, both girls. And I'm bending over to grab something, and my tracksuit pants burst at the bum. <laughs> like I just went, Whoosh. oh no! <laughs> and they actually nearly died of laughter, um, and and I nearly died of embarrassment. Um, yeah, and that had an effect. Uh, it, it was a bit of a wake up call of, yeah, you've actually uh, you've put on a little bit of weight. You need to sort that out. I don't know that it was a permanent effect, but it did remind me that you do want to, um, you know, there's that, that saying, um, you can't lead the cavalry if you don't look good on a horse. If you're going to work in strength and conditioning, you do need to be a little emblematic of mm -hmm. some level of strength yeah. and conditioning. Um, yeah. I don't think you have to be incredible. Like you don't have to be like, you know, like one of our coaches, former coaches, um, James Gears, is now running a great business, um, Peninsula Sports Performance down on, in Rosebud Way. Um, he could do standing backflips. Like he was in incredible shape. Don't think you have to do that, but you have to be credible. Is what I say to everyone. Just you know, you've got to be, in, you know, able to do do the stuff. Uh, last one of the quick fire. Um, would your ambitions change if you had one year to live? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, because I if I had if I had one year to live, I would sell Core Advantage, and I would quit all my jobs, and I'd spend a year trying to work out how I could prepare my kids for me not being around. Uh, so I'd probably I'd probably divide my time fifty percent between just being with them, mm-hmm. and fifty percent with recording videos for every year like i'd be like recording you know from the grave okay so now you're 21 what you're going to notice at this like I'd, be, I'd probably make that a project of, of my yeah, legacy yeah. being a, a bit of a guidebook to them i suppose i was super lucky in that in, in the, my folks uh I, I won the parent lottery and so i'd want to try and pay that forward to my kids that's the, the best answer i've had so far on that question for sure Cool. Mate, from here, have you got any kind of advice that you want to give to any kind of up-and-coming strength coaches or um, people in, in the industry? Yeah, lots. Um, I'll try, <laughs> I'll try not to go for too long. But the first thing is to just create that level of comfort within yourself because if you're comfortable with you, people around you will be comfortable with you and every element of your career will go better. And so one of the, most, one of the easiest start points for that is just to meditate. And a lot of people talk about meditating, but not many people actually do it consistently. Just low bar, 10 minutes a day. That can be an incredible um, way to change how you interact with people. When I've meditated most consistently, what I've noticed is that I can be in a highly charged situation and I can almost zoom up above my head and see, see what's going on, sort of a bird's eye view. I can see what's happening better. Whereas when I'm not meditating, I'm more prone to be caught right in the moment and just and just feel my feelings as though my feelings are truth rather than just feelings. If you can do that, that's a mild superpower. I'd say meditate, you know, if you want to meditate and journal and you could consist, I'm, I'm inconsistent with the journaling. I'd like to be better at that. Mm-hmm. You do those two things consistently. Where Whatever you turn your mind to, you're going to do, do better at. Um, the next one would be reading. So uh, it's really interesting reading is becoming more and more like long form reading, not scrolling um, is becoming more of a lost, a lost art. And to me, it's crazy. Like someone can have spent 70,000 hours in a field learning everything there is to know about that field. They'll then spend 3000 hours writing a book about that thing. And I've got to spend four hours reading it. And so for four hours, I get their 70,000 hours worth of knowledge. I'm like, that is the bargain of the century. And <laughs> some people are like, I don't have time for that. I'm like, what are you talking about? How could you not have time for that? Like, make the time, you know? Yeah, so that would be that would be it as well. And don't be so protective. I, when I was younger, I was more, I don't know, like I always felt a little defensive about what I was doing. I, I wasn't as interested as I should have been in what other people thought. Um, like I'll never forget, I was away. We're away in Taiwan for thing. There was the World Club Championships. How it used to work is, if you won the national championship, each team uh, would be invited away to this World Club Championships played in Russia, and the qualifiers were in Taiwan. Uh, and so we were playing against uh, the South Korean team. And I remember a, a friend of mine, actually the president I mentioned before, who was referring these basketballs to me. And he, he, he says to me, look at that warm-up. And it was the, the South Koreans doing this amazing warm-up. It was really cool. So, you know, we do a warm-ups in formation where you're all in a line on the baseline, say, in basketball, and you're going up and back. Well, they did their formation like a conga line, which I hadn't seen at that point. Um, and so the first person would lead, and they would all copy. And I just kind of weaved around the court doing this sort of conga line warm-up. And it was really cool because they were all kind of in unison. It had momentum to it. Because I was defensive about our warm up, like mm. Chuck said to me, he's like, "That's amazing." And I was like, "Oh, it's all right." Like I, I didn't have, I wasn't open. Yeah, right. Uh, and yeah, like being open to other ideas because you can always learn a little bit from other people. Like I should, I should have seen that and been like, "That's brilliant. Let's try that." But instead, I was a little bit closed. So meditate, journal, which will both those things will help you to be more open. Mm. Read will help you to be more open, and then just be open rather than closed. Yeah, so, so the other thing I would say is to, um, to look after your body in the sense that uh, a lot of us, we, we just train ourselves ragged. s coaches, we get into the space because we love lifting, 
and we love training hard. Uh, and so we tend to, to work ourselves pretty hard and not be necessarily be that focused on longevity. So it's more about, you know, can you lift really heavy things now? Can you do impressive plyometrics now? Um, and the great shame of that is a lot of people kind of run out of, like the amount of SNC events I've been at where older coaches like, oh, I, I demo this kind of squat, but I can't because my knee hurts too much. Um, like they've actually worn out their own capacity. So in the same way that we want to preserve the potential of our athletes and bulletproof them, uh, I think our training should be more geared around bulletproofing ourselves and not ourselves this year, but but future selves. Um, so I'm, I'm 48. And if you looked at any given year of my training, you would be pretty underwhelmed. You'd be like, yeah, he's lifting moderate weights quite well. He's running reasonably fast. Like there's nothing impressive about it at all. Um, but what I have successfully done is I've kept my body in a state where deep into my 50s and 60s, I anticipate still being able to demo stuff. Um, and I think that I, and I saw a guy a, lot of, a long time ago, uh, coach, is, uh, coach Kerry Rupp. And he was, he, he was a basketball coach that started out as a strength and conditioning coach. And he's credited with being the guy that really helped whip Andrew Bogut into shape in college. Because uh, Andrew Bogut came out of college in amazing shape. Mm. Because in the rest of his career, he looked after himself quite well. But in college, like he, the reason he was a top, um, top 10 draft pick was he was just in incredible shape. It's Kerry Rupp was sort of behind that. Kerry was this guy in his 50s demoing stuff on court. I remember just looking at him going, wow, you are a full, full ninja and you're, you're deep into your 50s. So I, I lost my way a little bit with my own training for a while where, you know, you work in a gym for 15 years. Yeah, like you just get sick of the gym a bit. Uh, and so the best thing I ever did was invest in a home gym. So I've got this beautiful 767 square meter gym partnered with Iron Edge. Like our gym is exquisite. Like it's an amazing gym. And I almost never train there. Uh, so I do 98% of my training in a tiny little um, space that is 1.6 meters deep, three meters wide. Um, um, but uh, it means that I get the consistency in. And so what I discovered was, when I let the training go, A, I got a bit skinny fat, um, but B, my demonstration capacity got worse. And I just didn't feel as energized and good. Uh, whereas now, like, yeah, every, I either go for, I step out the door and I, and I run um, and I alternate intervals with um, steady state running every second run. And then every second lift is a push lift or a pull lift. Um, and it took me a long time to work out that that was the perfect combo for longevity because what happens is, if I do a push lift on a Monday um, and then 48 hours later, I'm doing a pull lift on a Wednesday and then Friday I'm doing a push lift again. Um, so it's a lot, it's, it's um, 96 hours between workouts as a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's really good way for allowing your body to kind of uh, do that peak uh, collagen supercompensation. So you allow your tendons and, and ligaments, just everything to get back up. Uh, yeah. But I would strongly say commit to, like don't just think about how you're training now, but it's like, well, how's this going to look in 15 years time? Um, everyone, when they're young, they, and I'm, I'm always pulling my coaches up on this. And so they'll lift and I'm like, yeah, the part of your brain that assesses risk is not fully operational till you are 26 years old in the male brain. <laughs> like we are literally danger blind till we're 26. And so I say to everyone, yeah, that, that's great doing, doing double body weight, but maybe just 1.5 would have sufficed uh, and you'll have that, that longevity. So that'd be a really important thing for, for your coaching practice and just life health as well. Like, yeah, play the long game. No, awesome. Thanks for sharing those ones, mate. Now for the big one. Have you got... Oh, no. Have you got a dad joke for me? <sighs> like, I do dad jokes all the time around the house, but they're just all very situationally specific. I haven't got a dad joke. I've got a daughter joke, though. Go for it. Uh, which is okay. Um, and so my daughter's nine, and she's 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 pretty funny because um, daughter jokes are better than dad jokes because obviously they're kind of the opposite of it. So um, we're driving uh, along Danong Road, and there's a big plumbing supplies shop on the left, uh, and it has a sign on the front of it, and it's and we uh, we to put it in context, we've been watching the Cosmos documentary with Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, which is an amazing exposition of you know, the Cosmos. And we're driving along and there's a, she sees the sign and, and it says, 
um, you know, taps, blah, 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 solar systems. Uh, and she points to it and she goes, how are they going to fit them in there? Oh, that's gold. That is actually How good is that for a nine-year-old? Yeah, I was going to say, a nine-year-old just trying to listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson and just understanding all that. Yeah, she's going to be she's going to be a nightmare by the time she's 12 because she's already um, smarter than me. It's not going to be good. Awesome, mate. Awesome. Um, now, would you like anything to say to, uh, about Core Advantage, anything you want the listeners to hear about? No, like, look... Uh, we have our own little podcast, which will um, will give you, your thing a plug on that as well, because this has been great, and I've loved all your questions. Um, so we got the we changed it from um, the Random Thoughts Show to the Athletic Development Show. So we're interviewing lots of guests on that. Um, so get around that if you're interested in that kind of stuff. And we've got a brand new website, which we built in the last lockdown. So it's a sweet new website that I'm pretty happy with. It's got everything that all of our resources, courses, and uh, our internship and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and we do have a lot of applicants for our internship. Uh, if you are interested in that, please go to the website and follow the instructions. Um, we uh, have a bit of a filter there via the instructions. Feel free to get in touch if you've got, got questions. And um, yeah, um, and I do post um, very sporadically on Instagram. So you know, if you are following me, Durham underscore McInnes, uh, that's uh, slightly interesting, but much more interesting is probably Jacob's page, uh, VBT coach. Uh, like he's doing stuff every week. He's becoming, he's rapidly owning the rabbit hole of VBT, velocity-based training. Uh, mm. So that's something you could check out as well. That's much, much drier than my touchy-feely stuff, um, but it's also super interesting. Durham. Awesome, mate. Really appreciate your time. Okay, hope you enjoyed that episode. You'll find all the relevant show notes over at coreadvantage.com.au. Also on the website, you can find more information about our uh, athletic development services, education, uh, short courses, and uh, everything else we're up to. So that's coreadvantage.com.au. Cheers, guys. See ya.